Okay, unit two, um, lecture two. Um, we did a little lock and pain last night and um, their influence on Jefferson and Declaration. Now I want to get to the road to revolution, um, uh, how, we, how we get to that declaration in, in um, July of 1776. <clears throat> Before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment though to say that what we do here online is the minimum, is the minimum as presented by um, the state. Um, in the Virginia and U.S. history as well. And sometimes <clears throat> it's a little frustrating um, that the time constraints that are put on us and, and um, the lack of depth that we get to go into certain things, which I'm hoping to change or, um, through this. You know, we, we can discuss this online and then in class hopefully expand our knowledge and our discussion of some of these topics, especially things like the American Revolution, where I feel there should be a little more time spent. All right, so some key SOL stuff um, for this uh, lecture. Um, the ideas of the Enlightenment and the perceived unfairness. Perceived means this is the way the American colonists saw things, okay, their idea. So the perceived unfairness of British policies um, provoked debate and resistance by American colonists, okay? <clears throat> so some background that brings us to this resistance um, and the policies or the British enacting policies that the, the colonists will perceive as unfair. Um, the rivalry between England and France. So England and France are enemies. They're going to be competing in North America trying to expand their interests and um, control over the Ohio River Valley is going to lead to a conflict we call the French and Indian War. Okay, It's called this because the French and the British fight each other and the Indians fight on both sides. They both have Indian allies. Okay, The British are going to win this war and drive the French out of Canada <coughs> and their lands west of the Appalachian Mountains. All right. Um, this is a cause, the major cause of the American Revolution, because it's going to change the way the British interact with their colonies. Um, something to keep in mind, war is um, always expensive, okay? It always costs a great deal of money. And the French and Indian War is going to cost the British Empire a ton of cash. So up until this point, the British didn't really care or concern themselves with enforcing established laws in the day-to-day -day running of the American colonies. Okay. Um, but because of the expense, they're going to change the nature of things. Okay. So before the French and Indian War, they practiced what we call salutary neglect. They let the colonies alone to do whatever they want, as long as money's coming in for the British. So this is about 1763, all right, 1607 um, is the founding of Jamestown. So for 160 years almost, the colonies have kind of run themselves and gotten used to the idea of running themselves, or at least having a great deal of say in what goes on in the colonies. All right, now because of the expense of the French and Indian War, the British are going to take actions that they hope will get the, the colonies to contribute more to their own defense, okay? And these actions are going to anger the colonists and lead to eventually the revolution. So the first thing the British do after the French and Indian War is the proclamation of 1763. This forbids the colonists from moving west of the Appalachian Mountains. And they forbid the colonists, or sell the colonists, they can't move west of the Appalachian Mountains for two reasons. One, um, the British's Indian allies live over there, all right? So they want to protect their allies. And second, um, they want to protect the colonists, or at least minimize conflict between Indians and colonists that will cause the British to send in a larger army or more troops, which is expensive, okay? The problem with this is land is wealth. More and more people are coming to the colonies all the time. The land east of the Appalachians is taken, so people need to move west to get land and change their social status, all right, for opportunity. So after the proclamation of 1763 comes a tax on documents, the Stamp Act, which is going to be the first time the British directly ta tax the colonists. And this is, um, if you have a, a deed to property, you have to get a stamp on it. If you want a marriage, you have to get a stamp on the license. If you want a newspaper, you have to get a stamp on it. You have to pay the tax man to put a wax stamp on your papers. It really, really angers the colonists, and we'll go into it more in detail in class there. Okay, um, and then it's going to come the Tea Act and the Quartering Act. Quartering means putting troops in um, colonists' homes, okay? And we'll see these policies, how, how much they anger the colonists because they're going to have a direct influence on our Bill of Rights and some of the, the things that we put in, in there to prevent government from behaving in a certain way. All right, so all of these are efforts to get the colonists to contribute to the cost of their defense, okay? At least this is how the British see it. 
the colonists don't see it necessarily this way, and they begin to get angered, all right, about the taxes, and they have, um, especially because they have no say on it. So no taxation without representation becomes a catchphrase of the, the American Revolution, all right? Um, and it's not the taxes necessarily that anger them so much, because in a lot of ways, the colonists pay a lot less taxes than British subjects in Britain. The difference is British subjects in Britain have representation in Parliament, all right, the British lawmaking body. The colonists have no representation, so they have no say in the laws that are passed to rule them. And this bothers them, all right, especially because they see themselves as British subjects, and as British subjects, they should have say in Parliament, all right. So um, they start forming groups. The Sons and Daughters of, of Liberty um, are going to react to British tyranny. And um, they're going to form the Stamp Act Congress. Congress is a group of people, of representatives, to get together um, uh, to discuss the topic at the time. And this time, it'll be the Stamp Act. So they send a letter to the king saying, we hate your Stamp Act. All right? Um, and all of this, um, these things are going to come to a head in Boston in 1770 with um, the Boston Massacre. And ask me how that comes about in class. We'll discuss it in um, the, the HBO miniseries. Um, John Adams does a great portrayal of this, a great representation. All right, anyway, five colonists die at the Boston Massacre. Um, you have to know the name Crispus Attucks. He'll be the first African American to give his life for the cause of American independence, okay? This event will be used as propaganda by colonists um, to try and get people to, to see their cause. So propaganda is pictures and writings and um, an attempt to sway public opinion to get you to feel a certain way. So the Boston Massacre is going to be used as propaganda by the colonists to get public opinion behind their cause. Resistance is going to start to grow after this, especially in the North. And again, this has um, a bit to do with geography, okay? Remember, New England uh, is full of towns. On the North has cities. So people see each other daily. They re interact daily. And um, news travels much faster, and dissent travels much faster, okay? It's easier to get um, more people to feel a certain way when we're interacting and seeing each other all the time. All right, so 1773. Um, Britain passes the Tea Act. Um, you notice how the Sons of Liberty are going to respond to this. They're going to dress up as um, Native Americans, um, board the British ships, and throw 20,000 pounds of tea into the harbor. A pound is a British monetary unit, so it's not you know, um, 10 tons of tea, it's um, 20,000 pounds worth. Um, the British respond by shutting down Boston Harbor, by um, suspending democracy in Massachusetts. Um, and, and sending more troops in, and then passing the Intolerable Acts, which are the Quebec and Coercive Act, which ask me about class, we need to know them. All right, um, this is gonna lead the colonists to call the first Continental Congress. So all of the colonies except Georgia send representatives to the first Continental Congress, and this is about the first time the colonies really act together as, as a unit, all right? Um, the resistance in Massachusetts is going to lead the British to send more troops in and actually send troops to capture um, men such as Sam Adams and John Hancock. And while they're going after them, they're also marching up to Lexington and Concord to get the colonial arms, okay, um, to seize the weapons the colonists have stockpiled there. So two guys, Paul Revere and William Dawes, um, I know you never heard of William Dawes, but he wrote to, and they ride out, ride out to the country outside yelling out. The regulars are coming, the regulars are coming, not the British are coming. They didn't say the British are coming because the colonists consider themselves British. So that'd be kind of silly to, you know, ride down saying, we're coming, we're coming. And that's not going to do anything. So the regulars are coming. They warn the countryside and um, the British march up and they're not going to find any weapons. But they meet a group of colonists, the Minutemen, all right, the colonial militia. Shots are fired. I don't know who shoots first, but we end up with eight dead colonists at the end of this exchange. Um, this is referred to the shot heard around the world. The, the revolution begins at Lexington and Concord. The first shot's fired. Okay? The British don't get any weapons, they don't seize any men, um, and they have to march back to Boston empty-handed, being harassed constantly the whole way by the colonial militia. And by the time they get back, uh, they've suffered um, several hundred casualties. All right, so we're about to start the revolution. I just want to take a quick look at the two sides before um, we get into the timeline tomorrow. All right, so first, um, and 
probably the most important thing we should realize going into the revolution is the colonists are divided. There's three different groups of colonists, okay? The patriots who believe in the patriots who believe in complete independence from the British and are inspired by the ideas of Locke and the writings of Thomas Paine. And this is a theme I hope to stay on and remind you of constantly throughout the course, and that's the power of the written word and the power of an idea, okay? You can't kill an idea. All right. Um, other patriots are going to be uh, Patrick Henry from Virginia will be an example. He said, famously says, give me liberty or give me death. Okay. Um, these men, the patriots, will provide the troops for Washington's American army. All right. Um, number two, we have the, uh, the loyalists or the Tories, and they remain loyal to Britain and believe um, that the taxes that were, were put forth by Parliament were fair because they're paying for colonial defense against the French as well as the Indians. The third group are neutrals. They don't care who wins as long as they're not killed, their families aren't killed, their houses aren't burnt, their businesses aren't wrecked. Okay. So those are the three groups of, of colonists during the Revolution. Be aware of them. All right. The two sides, a quick look at the two sides before the revolution, um, we have the colonies, okay? They're going to fight the British Empire. Uh, on the colony side, we have about 2.5 million people total. One third of them become patriots, okay? They have a weak government, very weak central government. Uh, they have no navy. Um, they have very little money, and they have to deal with colonial jealousy. There's 13 Does that colonies. Come, please, from the office? There's 13 colonies, and each of them jealously guard their, their power and influence, okay? Very few weapons. Fortunately, they have strong leaders um, and are fighting a defensive war and have France, the enemy of Britain, who is happy to help them. On the British side, you have about 7.5 million people, um, a strong government, um, possibly the world's strongest navy, a large and well-trained army, and the loyalists, okay? So these are the two sides facing each other. We'll pick up with the war tomorrow.